Hello and welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name's Toby and today I'm joined by Lena Topp and Florian Schwendinger. Lena is a policy analyst at the European Commission's Joint Research Centre, or JRC as everyone calls it, where she works on training and capacity building programmes to improve evidence-informed policy. And before she worked in the EU institutions, she was working on the other side of the gulf, as it were, as a consultant helping all kinds of organisations to interact with the institutions. And Florian is a policy analyst, also in the JRC, focusing on innovative ways for evidence to play a role in decision making. He previously worked in the European Parliament on flagship EU policies such as mobile roaming and the energy union. So welcome both of you to the podcast. Thank you, Toby. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Toby. I'm happy to be here. So this is one of those rare occasions when uh, this podcast is right on the button when it comes to timing, because we're going to talk about a project that you, I'm sure, have been working on for a while, but which, as I understand it, is only now coming to fruition, in that the report about your work is being published today, the day that this episode drops. Exactly, exactly. So this has been work that we've been on for, for up to two years now, working with a lot of colleagues. So we're happy to actually be in the podcast exactly the day that the report is coming out. Right. So congratulations. Well, it says here that you've been working on uh, competence frameworks for policymakers and for science advisors. Perhaps you could give us a plain English explanation of that rather corporate jargony sounding phrase. What is a competence framework? Well, to, to explain what a competence framework is, I think it's important to start with explaining what a competence actually is. And that is a combination of three elements. It's uh, skills, knowledge and understanding, and importantly, also attitude. And uh, these three build a competence. All three are important. Uh, Very often, the attitudinal bit is not addressed, but either of them is equally important. And a competence framework is uh, a collective set of those competences, organized and arranged in, in our case, clusters, Um, and then very often also unpacked and explained across different levels of proficiency, uh, like in our case, where we have four levels ranging from a foundational level up to an expert level. Okay, so a list, or rather an organized list, of the skills, knowledge and attitudes that people need. Exactly, it's it's an organized list. I mean, there are different um, methodologies and different approaches to how such competence frameworks are being uh, arranged. We used one that's called Entrecomp that organizes them competences in, in clusters. So you would have a description according to the attitude, skills, and knowledge involved per competence um, in each cluster, and then you would have these each competence explained across those four levels of proficiency, and those four levels explain how a competence would manifest um, in someone. So it's really a mix-up of learning outcomes of observable behaviors, as we would call them in our jargon. Okay. And these are competences for policymakers and for scientists who advise policymakers, right? Well, um, we're talking about two competence frameworks here. Um, The first one um, is on science for policy, about the specific competences that scientists, researchers need in the interface of science uh, and policy uh, to have impact on policymaking. Um, that's a very specific set of competences. And then the second competence framework is about innovative policymaking, about the competences, the cross-cutting competences that policymaking teams need to do policymaking um, in face of the challenging interconnected policy issues that we are working nowadays on. Okay. And before we get into what these things actually say, which of course is very interesting for the topic of this podcast, why have you made them? And why did the Joint Research Centre feel the need to create these frameworks? You could say that for the the science for policy one, so the one targeting uh, researchers, that actually a recent Eurobarometer survey showed that almost seven out of 10 Europeans agreed that scientists should engage in political debates to make sure that decision making is also taking into account scientific evidence. But engaging with policymakers requires a, a specific complementary set of competences. And this is not often, if ever, something that you're actually taught at university. So that's why we we went about this competence framework for scientists, because we realized that nobody had actually mapped the specific competences that you need when you work at this interface between science and policy. Okay. So so then you've got two well-described, well-mapped competence frameworks. Great. Why, Why do they exist? What do you do with them now? Um, well, 
So wh why do they exist? Those competence frameworks, they are meant to, on the one hand, provide guidance to, to inspire policymakers and, and researchers on those competences that, that are needed uh, to give them an idea. It's a, it's a very future-oriented, progressive account of, of, of what both professions entail. The, the second um, purpose of it is to help uh, organizations in the context of science for policy, but also uh, at different levels of public policy and governance, to map um, for example, their training programs against those competences to see um, what are we offering, what are the gaps, um, what additional training capacity building offerings could we offer um, to our staff and teams, and also to um, well to start a conversation around these topics. I think what we've seen already is in the making of these frameworks, this triggered a lot of conversations around on the topics that helped us further. Yeah, I think for, for the scientists, it's been that, you know, Many scientists are trying to increase the impact of their evidence on policy, but have not always been successful. And I think what we've done here is that we've shown them that maybe you haven't been successful because it actually requires these additional competences. And here you have a map of what are these competences and how do I go about acquiring them? You know, what level am I on and what do I need to know more or better uh, to be able to increase the impact of evidence on, on policymaking. And I think here an important point is also that it's a collective set of competences. So we're not advocating for any superhumans uh, or anything. It's really something that you as an organization or you as a team that you possess these competences. Uh, and then as an individual, you of course contribute to the team, but it's not something that you do on your own. Okay, great. Let's get into some specifics then and put some meat on the on the abstract bones that we've been playing around with so far. Florian, I gather you've been leading on the framework for policymakers. So perhaps without listing every part of it, since these things are quite substantial, you could give us an overview of what your framework says, what it says policymakers need in order to interact with outside evidence in terms of skills and attitudes and so on. Okay, so the framework is based on the original idea of the policy cycle, but uh, different from the policy cycle and the specific set of competences that you need at every stage of the policy cycle or in your thematic area, these competences are, are cross-cutting in nature. So they are meant to be relevant um, at, at all the stages. And th this framework addresses seven different clusters of competences, one on advising the political level, speaking to the fact that policymakers work with the political sphere, with the uh, politicians, with elected officials. Um, and the second uh, competence cluster is on innovation in policymaking in specific, um, that uh, includes competences ranging from creativity, critical thinking, but also importantly, systems thinking and managing those big transformation processes that we're facing then there is a competence cluster on working with evidence. And by working with evidence, I think it's important to say it's about scientific evidence, but also other types of knowledge. And uh, I think that's that's something very special about the framework that we try to integrate, but at the same time, distinguish what these different types of knowledge are and how you deal with them. Also, then there's a cluster on, on being futures literate, um, or, which means to anticipate as a policymaker, um, to use foresight techniques, for example, to identify and frame policy problems in the very beginning already than to engage with citizens and stakeholders, so elements of deliberative democracy, um, to collaborate, to um, leverage the collective intelligence in an organization, in teams, on a policy file, and lastly, to communicate. So, for example, communication entails leveraging the narrative power of policy work or to deal with mis- and disinformation. So these are the seven basically building blocks, and they unfold in, in total 36 competences. Um, and more than 350 uh, learning outcomes. Um, and these learning outcomes are, are uh, small statements, and these statements describe how competence manifests. So you would have several, so up to three, four learning outcomes uh, per level of competence. And the importance here, and, the, and I think the reason why we included these progression levels in the frameworks is that they convey a sense of progression, something that you can aspire to, but still based on, on the policymakers or researchers' reality. So these are the, the building blocks. Great. Just to, to be more concrete, could you give us an example of one of these learning outcomes, if you have one, uh, at your fingertips? Um, well, one of the learning outcomes, for example, in the competence on systems thinking is, I quote, can differentiate between natural, technological and human systems, recognizes the role of narratives in, in human systems. So, for example, this is, this is on the foundational level of 
the competence on systems thinking. Um, and in general, the progression levels follow a certain logic. So in the beginning, it's very often about understanding, about basic awareness, um, about recognition, um, about the attitude that you bring. Um, and, and the further you move up the progression level, the more it's about really acting, operationalizing at the higher levels, also about empowering others, um, supervising. And at the um, last level, the expert level, it's really about transformational level of competence, something that you might hardly ever see in your professional life, but definitely exists uh, as a level of competence and might be the result of years long experience. Yeah, experiential learning rather than classroom training. So one thing that struck me in what you just said is that is this framework, the one for policymakers, isn't just about evidence based policymaking, which I kind of assumed it was. That's just one thread, one one cluster to use your term. It seems like it's really about the competencies you need to be a good policymaker all round. Have I understood that right? Uh, I- I- indeed, that's the case. Though um, the aspect of working with evidence is a very central aspect that you will find has its own cluster, but is also more of a nested competence that you will find in other competence areas as well. Um, but that's also true to the other um, clusters. So I think I think what's important to say is this competence framework describes many competences in those areas that are relevant for the profession of policymaking. Um, and working with evidence is one important pillar in that. But um, we, we tried to basically single out and abstract those other competence areas and competences. But what's important here is to bear in mind, we didn't want to just abstract. We also really wanted to ground this in the professional life of policymakers. This is something that policymaking professionals should be able to relate this to their daily work. Um, so it's a fine line in terms of balancing, um, singling out competences, but making sure you have the connection in between the different competences still um, that make them relevant. Mm-hmm. You also have a cluster of competences, which you mentioned about advising the political level and the skills involved in doing that. I think that's interesting because you're making a distinction that actually is often not made when people talk about science advice to policy or the science policy interface. And it's something I'm guilty of as well, like talking about policy or policymakers as one coherent group, when really there's a big difference between the people who draft the policies and the politicians who have the final say. And I think including competencies about communicating with politicians for policymakers, for, you know, presumably civil servants, really highlights that they have a kind of advising role too, which can include science advice, I suppose. And there's a a set of skills and attitudes that they need to do that. Uh, Well, as as you said, I mean, there is... As I mentioned at the beginning, there there is a difference between the policymakers that that design uh, policy and implement policy on the basis of a mandate that they've been given by political decision makers. And for for us, it was important to to distill and highlight the group of competences that those policymakers need in order to interact with the political level. And I think it's a very distinct set of competences, um, like being able to, in the beginning, identify and frame the policy problem, but also uh, drafting briefings and speeches, for example, something very specific, something very important in the work life of a policymaker, but also policy advice. There's not just policy advice that, for example, is given by the scientific community to policymakers and politicians, but there's also policy advice that's being given by um, policy officials, for example, here in the European Commission, then to commissioners, to political decision makers. And, and that entails its specificities as well. Yeah, very good. Is there anything in here for politicians themselves? Well, um, I, w- I would say yes. Uh, this is not specific to, to politicians, uh, but I think there are many insightful and inspiring uh, progressive ideas in there that also politicians can pick up. Um, they, this framework is certainly relevant beyond the profession. I mean, you have, you have, for example, a cluster like collaboration in there. And you could argue collaboration is not specific to the policymaking community, but to any profession. But nevertheless, I mean, we describe collaboration, for example, in a way that is meaningful to the context of policymaking, but I think also something that is relevant for politicians as well. So uh, there the boundaries are blurring a little bit, but definitely there is relevance beyond the policymaking profession. So one of the things that stuck out to me a little bit uh, is this cluster of competences you have about negotiation. Um, I wonder if you want to comment a little bit more on what you had in mind there. Like in what areas of your work does being a good negotiator help you with being a good policymaker? Well, when you take a look at the policy cycle, um, negotiation, as we found, is a competence that is relevant relevant 
both externally and internally, so within the organization and within uh, the organization when it comes to the policy design process, but also towards the external at different stages. And it's actually a form of cooperation. So on a spectrum of cooperation, you would have, for example, negotiation, you would have coordination, and um, th then later on you would have, for example, participatory collaboration, co-creation processes. And negotiation plays a role when it comes to, for example, champion and negotiating your position uh, that you might have as, for example, a directorate with a certain specific aim on a more interconnected policy file where different directorates have to work together, there it's also important that you are able to negotiate. Um, so so you, you would have negotiation scenarios within the organization, but also then externally, say, if you are negotiation, uh, negotiating with another governance organization. Great. Let's talk a little bit about the other side of the coin then, the competence framework for science advisors, which means, Lena, welcome back to the conversation. Thanks for being so patient. What do we need to know about this list of competences that scientists need? Yeah, I think it's good to remind ourselves that the, the competence framework, the scope of it is that it's targeting scientists who are already well-trained in carrying out research and who can communicate scientific findings to other scientists effectively, but who are seeking to further develop their competence to have greater impact on policy. So it's really these competences that you need when you work at the interface between science and policy. So there's five clusters of competences. I remind again that it's it's important to stress that it's a collective set of competences so that we're not advocating for creating superhumans who possess all these competences. Um, and that so it's something that you cover at organizational or department level. If we then take a look at the five clusters that we have in the competence framework, the first one is called understanding policy. And in here, it's really about you know, understanding the evidence needs for policymakers, not the evidence needs seen from the researcher's point of view. It's about uh, policy relationships and networks. So again, uh, relationships and networks outside the, the scientific world. We have the, the second cluster, which is on participating in policymaking. Um, in here, for example, we have uh, competences on knowledge programming, so building a bridge between science and policy, on, on political sensitivity. That maybe goes a little bit also to the negotiation in, in the policymaker framework, because here, as a researcher, uh, we should have kind of a, a sensitivity to for what is politically uh, possible. Um, in this cluster here, we also have, for example, a competence on, on writing uh, for policymakers. Uh, Writing for policymakers is very different to writing uh, for, for, for a research publication. And then we have the, the communication cluster. Actually, the last three clusters, the communication and engagement and collaboration, they are the same as in the policymaker, uh, almost identical, only slight differences. So this is also to show that there are lots of common competences uh, that policymakers and, and researchers require. Okay, so what's in there? In the communication cluster here, here we have a communication mindset. So this we talked about before. It's not enough to know how to do it, but it's actually also having the mindset to say, I do think that communicating is important, is something that I'm going to invest time and resources in as a researcher. Um, we have something in there about storytelling, dealing with myths and disinformation. And then we have the, the cluster D on citizen and stakeholder engagement. Again, there's a mindset competence. Uh, and then there are competences on planning and designing citizen engagement and stakeholder engagement, respectively. Yeah, that makes sense. One thing that seems to be very clearly uh, running through a lot of these competences is the importance of communication skills. And I wonder what exactly you have in mind there, if this is something specific to communicating with policymakers, or if it's something broader, like in the scientist's own work as well. In this competence framework here, is really about communicating with policymakers, stakeholders, and and citizens. Yeah, it's not about improving the competences to for peer for writing peer-reviewed articles or for presenting at scientific conferences. Is is really to emphasize that is a different way of communicating when you communicate 
with policymakers from how you write uh, for a scientific uh, journal. And this is what we want to emphasize here. Um, what is maybe also worth mentioning is that we don't actually claim that what's in here is rocket science. What, <laughs> what, we, say, what we say is that we have four researchers, four policymakers, we've mapped it into, into one, one frame or into two different frameworks. And then you have one place to go where you can go and get an overview of the competencies. But the way we've worked is that we have collected best practices from colleagues from inside and outside the commission. We've done a literature review, but I think the added value is actually that we've collected them in one place now where you can go and consult and get uh, ideas to how to improve. Yeah, good. So I was going to ask a bit about where you got this stuff from. I mean, not just the research framework, but both of the frameworks. Um, so it's interesting to hear it's based partly on the literature, which means my next thought is, what do you find when you look there? Has this all been done before? Is this stuff kind of all out there and evidence-based and you just had to synthesize it? Or was your work more creative? And in which case, what about the evidence? So when you took a look at the, the, the literature, you so partially some of the competences have been addressed. I mean, the competences themselves have all of them somewhere uh, be, being addressed, but not as an overview, not, not as a complete account, and also not uh, unpacked across levels of proficiency. And I think our, our approach is really, in that sense, practice informed. So what we did, for example, on the policymaking framework, we worked with experts in these different areas, mainly within the commission, but also from, from outside, to describe those competences based on their practice, based on their knowledge about the competences. And these people are practitioners in policymaking, but also practitioners, for example, on foresight, on anticipation, on citizen engagement, um, that work with policymakers um, on those processes. And uh, the way that we did this is, is really to work in a very iterative way via countless versions of those competences um, in order to be able to describe them in a way that is, that, that is accessible that is meaningful at the same time is, is also grounded still in the professional reality um, of people. Um, sometimes what we hear is that, you know, we're introducing a lot of novel elements, but on the other hand, what you see um, in these frameworks um, has been there already. It's rather mainstreaming or highlighting best practice that you can already see in, for example, policymaking and science for policy, but may, maybe not to the same level um, in different organizations. This is also let's say, um, our approach towards helping mainstream um, many of the practices that have already been around. And I think what you can also find in our frameworks is that this attitudinal aspect, there's not that many competence frameworks out there. And the ones that we've seen, few of them address the attitudinal aspects, which we find is, is equally important to the knowing and to the doing. So I think that that's a novelty in, in the frameworks and also a lot of the learning will happen on the job. We're talking about professionals here. So on the, on the first levels, on the foundational and, and, and so on, maybe some will happen in a classroom. But later on, actually most of it will happen on the job uh, by um, deliberately being part of projects where you're being faced with certain uh, challenges so that you can grow uh, or where you get certain tasks so that you can get hands-on experience on writing briefings or negotiating or, or what it might be. Right. Well, given the way that you've described putting this stuff together, do you see these frameworks then as a contribution themselves to the academic literature? rather than just a tool for professionals? Like, do you imagine that researchers might take them on and test them and develop them further? I think in, in the report that is coming out today, what we say is that now we've developed them. Now they're ready to be tested. So we invite anybody uh, to, to take them and kind of localize them to their own context. Um, th these competence frameworks, they've been developed by the European Commission, but they're not only for the European Commission or the JSC. We have tried our utmost not to make them JSC or commission specific so that anybody can take them and pick them up. Um, just uh, last week, I was asked to do a, a presentation to a, a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence on, on Sustainable Blue Economy. 
and they want to uh, develop a competences for researchers working on the sustainable blue economy. So they will take this framework as their starting point, and then they will adapt it to their context, to their sector. This is kind of the ideal scenario that that organizations, policymakers, researchers can take it and then adapt it uh, as they say, see best fit for their own uh, context. And as Lene already pointed out, we do, however, also apply those frameworks in our own context. So within the JRC um, or the uh, European Commission, for example, there is um, the Central Professional Development Initiative for Policymakers in the European Commission that's called the EU Policymaking Hub. And on the basis of, of the work of this hub, uh, we actually started this project in the first place. Um, and, and we will also use uh, this work in the context of this professional development initiative and then now work on implementing it, yeah, seeing what the next steps are in, in making this an integral part of, of, of our work. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's obviously a, a laudable aim. But one thing that strikes me, especially when you look at the attitudes category you have rather than the skills and the knowledge, but maybe all three to a degree. Anyway, one thing that jumps out is that the descriptions of these things are quite generic, quite high level. Maybe generic isn't the right word, but abstract. Now, I, probably that's deliberate because you didn't want to key it directly into a European Commission context or whatever. You wanted it to be generally applicable. But I don't know, you have things like um, fosters a culture of openness to sharing ideas and learning, you know, or recognizes citizens as legitimate participants in science for policy. I mean, I can imagine a researcher looking at that and saying, okay, I see why that's important, but what do I do with that information? What does it really mean in concrete terms? How do I figure out whether I'm good at it or not? What do I do if I want to take it further? I don't know. Perhaps this is beyond the scope of the frameworks themselves, but do you see what I mean? So what we are still working on is is a self-assessment tool. Um, the idea with the tool is also that it gives you pointers to how to develop, how to uh, progress. So to answer your question, in in the report of the self-assessment tool, there would be indications to how to, if, if you want to progress on a certain attitude or, or skill or, or knowledge, then there would be indicators on how, how to go about it. Okay, so this is, this is like a quiz, is it? So the self-assessment tool is basically taking, for each framework, answer uh, yes or no to the, to the learning outcomes that we have in there now. So can I do this? Am I able to do this? Do I have this mindset? And then a report will come out at the end, which will give you indications on where do you stand for each uh, cluster of competences, and then give you also ideas to where are their resources, whether it's trainings, whether it's material to read, whether it's podcast, uh, what have you, with uh, resources to, to progress further on various uh, competences. And I think it's important to, to stress that this self-assessment tool is going to be equally accessible to uh, researchers and policymakers inside and outside the commission. Um, so any governance organization, any research organization can go and pick it up and say, okay, in this self-assessment tool, I'm going to create myself a group that I want to, to assess the level of competences of, like a department or something. And then you can have individual members of that team assess their own competences. You can ask them to assess the collective set of competences. This is kind of to avoid the bias as uh, apparently as, as human beings, we tend to overestimate our own uh, level of competence. So by by assessing the collective one, we, we have a little bit of a, a buffer or a kind of a way to, to balance it. Um, so what so to say that this is also a way of kind of getting it simply on the agenda competence development in in these areas because in in some organizations this is not really on the agenda but still we want to deliver more and more or better and better and this is also a way of saying oh we have a gap here on communication or, or something that might be why we are we are not as impactful as as we would have wanted to be and and maybe if I may compliment Lene um, on, on this point of how to translate this into action. Um, another way to translate this into action is, for example, for learning and development um, specialists, those people that develop new training or capacity building formats, 
to, to take the descriptions in these frameworks, these learning outcomes, as, as I called them before, to check them against the learning offering, to check, check them against, for example, their trainings, to see does our learning path address these learning outcomes? And to which extent is this the case? Or could we think of a more experiential um, capacity building offer that we could build to, to help people progress from, say, an intermediate to an advanced level on, on, on this competence or in this cluster. Um, so it's also meant to trigger reflection in this regard. And we've also started using it internally to develop new learning paths. Uh, our colleagues in the different competence areas would take these statements as it described and then apply them to developing a new learning path that covers those learning outcomes. And maybe yet another way to use them is um, for, for example, for job advertisements or job profiles. So especially for the scientific organizations, if you're looking to have policy impact, do the job advertisements that you develop, do they also include science for policy competences? Or do they primarily or entirely focus on the scientific competences that you're looking for? And also in, in terms of the job profiles that we draft, another way could be, say, we have a project but you look at the, uh, the the objectives that you have for the project, you try to, to find out which are the competences that you need to deliver this project, and then you, you check the, the competences or you assess the competences of your project team. Is there a gap between the competences of the team and the competences that we require to, uh, to achieve the objectives of the project? Um, and if so, you, you try to make the necessary adjustments. Thank you very much. Well, I must say it's a really interesting project and I do highly recommend for people to go and check out these frameworks. They provide quite a lot of food for thought. I think even if, or maybe especially if you already think about these kinds of topics, the skills and attitudes that people need to work at the science policy interface, because seeing it all laid out in the way that you've done it is really very thought provoking. Actually, I have to congratulate you also, and I guess your colleagues on a very nice bit of graphic design and programming, because not only are these frameworks colorful and easy to look at, but there's this lovely kind of animation thing on the commission website where you get the clusters presented as a, as a kind of flower and you click on one of the petals and it unfolds in a very nice way to show you the elements within that cluster. And it's all very satisfying to play with on the screen. So I will, of course, put the link to that in the show notes and I hope people who are interested in this kind of thing, check it out. And actually, I'm quite sure that many listeners, having heard what you have to say about it, will be interested. So Thank you, Florian Schwendinger and Lena Top for, well, firstly, for the work you've done, and then especially for your willingness to share that work with the community and to talk about it on the podcast. Thank you, Toby. Many thanks, Toby. The Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academy networks, representing more than 100 academies, young academies and learning societies from more than 40 countries across Europe. We're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism and as such we're funded by the European Union. Having said that, the opinions on this podcast are those of the guests, and sometimes mine, but they're not the views of Sapea and certainly not of the European Commission. And finally, this lovely cello music is written by Carlo Alfredo Piatti and performed by Elisaveta Sushchenko. And I'm sorry for talking over it. 